Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your holy word, the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for his life, his death, his resurrection. We thank you for its story and all of the parts of it. May we be blessed through its reading and through its proclamation this morning. May we hear anew what it is that you would have us hear, that we might live the lives that you would have us live. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I wanted to take some time this Mother's Day morning to think about Mary, the mother of Jesus. Um, most of our imagination about Mary comes from the Christmas story, right? Mary pregnant and traveling. Um, imagine having, travel, having to travel from Nazareth to Bethlehem. We imagine her atop a donkey, but decked in blue. She's weary, and she's traveling, and she's very, very, very pregnant. But majestic and persevering, uncomplaining, accepting, doing what she must. It's her duty, after all. It's captured in song, I think, best by Amy Grant, her, her song, Breath of Heaven. Listen to some of these words. It's, it's how majestic, right? I have traveled many moonless nights, cold and weary, with a babe inside, and I wonder what I have done, Holy Father, that you have come and chosen me now to carry your son. So in that, you see this sense, what have I done? What have, and again, it's, it's a gift of grace. It's to be chosen, it's to be called, to be called, it's to be loved, and to be loved is to never be abandoned. But yet, that's quite the ride. And she's willing to take it. She says, I'm waiting in a silent prayer. I am frightened by the load I bear. In a world as cold as stone, must I walk this path alone? Be with me now. Be with me now. God, be with me. That's what she's asking. To not be abandoned again. To have God be with her. But yet there's the world as cold as stone. And we get the image of the stone and the empty tomb. Or the, at least the tomb and the stone. that Whether it would be rolled away. And in that wonderful chorus, breath of heaven, hold me together, be forever near me, breath of heaven. Breath of heaven, light my darkest, pour over me your holiness, for you are holy, breath of heaven. We, the, the beauty of that chorus is that it connects us with that. Like we're on our journey, on our struggle, on our persevering roles, we ask for the Holy Spirit, that breath of heaven, to come into us just like she does. And so the the chorus kind of draws us into her and her experience and how it's similar. Do you wonder as you watch my face if a wiser one should have had my place? She says, it almost evokes Moses, right? Like, I have no gift of speaking. I, who am I that you would call me? Am I worthy of this job? that you're calling me to. But in the moment of that moment of doubt, she says, but I offer all I am for the mercy of your plan. Help me be strong. Help me be, help me. Again, slowly taking off any control that she has. Help me be strong. Maybe I can't be strong. Help me be, just help me exist. No, just help me, whatever happens. Help me. Again, breath of heaven, hold me together, comes from that. So Mary, humble and strong, strong in spirit, if not in body, the breath of heaven is in her. She's not sure what she's going to expect as the bearer of God, but willing. And we see all of that coming through in the Annunciation text that Corley read this morning, right? How can I do this if I'm just a virgin? <laughs> That's the least of the problems she's going to have to deal with. <laughs> Believe me. I am Lord, the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your words to me be fulfilled. That's the final line that she speaks there to the angel. And the angel leaves. I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. That's enough. And that brings us to our second of the famous 
so perfectly written modern classic songs imagining this moment of Mary. This is sung by everyone who's ever wanted to sing. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water? Mary, did you know that your baby boy will save our sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new? This child that you've delivered will soon deliver you. Mary, did you know that your baby boy will give sight to a blind man? Mary, did you know that your baby boy will calm the storm with his hand? Did you know that your baby boy has walked where angels trod, and when you kissed your little baby, you've kissed the face of God? Mary, did you know that the blind will deaf, the blind will see, the deaf will hear, the dead will live again, the lame will speak, the dumb, the lame will leap, the dumb will speak the praises of the Lamb. Mary, did you know that your baby boy is, boy is Lord of all creation? Mary, did you know that your baby boy will one day rule the nations? Did you know your baby boy is heaven's perfect lamb? The sleeping child you're holding is the great I am. Mary, did you know? The thing is, Mary does know all of that. That stuff was the easiest stuff that Mary would have to come to terms with in her life, right? All of the fact that her son is the miraculous child of God, capable of doing wonders. Once you've been miracled pregnant, once you've been visited by an angel, the amazing, miraculous God stuff, that's the stuff you can wrap your mind around, and you can wrap your presence around. And of course, the biblical answer to all of this, all of the questions in that song are, yes, Mary did know that. That's the only biblical answer to, the, to that question. Still, the song somehow captures our imagination and proclaims the wonderful side of the idea of carrying Jesus in your womb. And it's like her Magnificat does the same thing later in Luke. She says, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him. From generation to generation, his, mortal, his uh, mercy extends. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but he has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. So the woman who says that can answer every question in Mary, did you know, with a resounding affirmative. Yes, I knew all of that. And that's pride that we see again at her second appearance in the story at the wedding of Cana in John 2. It says, on the third day there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. This is Mary. Jesus was also invited to the wedding with his disciples. And when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, Hey, son, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has yet not come. And his mother said to the servants, the servants do whatever he tells you to do. <laughs> right? He doesn't say go ahead, but she boldly pushes the story forward and tells the servants to do whatever. So when the servants come, she, he says, well, go ahead and fill up those things with water. <laughs> and it's the best wine that they've ever had. Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then this poor, poor, then the poor wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. Good to have Jesus at a party. At least if his mother's there to egg him on. Here Mary seems ready to revel in her son's being, his son's how her son's powers, his specialness his uniqueness, and his singularity. That's my son, my boy. Look at my son. You have a problem, he can solve it. 
This is a great day for Mary. You can see her beaming. Like it's a college graduation, like it's a high school graduate, it's like it's hitting the winning double down the line, and you're sitting there in the crowd just. <laughs> the dance on stage, the, the play, the, the whatever. You see the potential of your child coming forth, and you can just beam and be excited because this is one of those days as a parent that you feel like everything is going right. And, and the one job you have was to bring out and let that child reach their potential and they are on that day. This is success. This is achievement. This is the high watermark of being a parent. But then, somehow we see what happens in Mark 3, starting at verse 20. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. It's a different story. It's a different place in the family, family dynamic, but yet very real. My child, who I just saw with the most amazing potential and achievement is now going down a road and a path that I'm not sure whether I should let him go down it. What is my mothering duty here? Because, And we can say, well, it's just his family, it's not his mother, but later there in verse 31 says, then Jesus' mother and his brothers arrived, um, standing outside, they sent someone to call him in, a crowd was sitting around him and they told him, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. And Jesus says, who are my mother and brothers? Then he looked at those seated around him in a circle and said, here are my mother and brothers. Whoever does God's will is my mother, my brother, my sister, my mother. Here we see the seeds being planted of the problem of being the mother of Jesus. Because Jesus is going to get himself into trouble. And how do moms do with this? How do you do with the path that your child is going to walk that is fraught with peril, but yet you know deep in your heart that it's the path that they must walk? And if you were to keep them safe from that path, you would be not allowing them to reach the potential that they need to reach to walk the path and the steps that God has for them to walk. How do you let them do it? How do you let your son face that kind of trial? How do you not want to stop and get in the way? How do you not want to shake him and say, son, you're out of your mind. Get yourself straight. Think clearly about this. You can see a mom being very much like Peter, right? Not, not, not a son, just a friend, saying, this cannot happen. You cannot go through this. You are going to get into trouble, and I'm going to have to watch it. And how can you do this to me when I raised you and I brought you orange juice when you were sick? <laughs> I'm going to have to. Don't you have any feelings for your mother? Your mother loves you, raises you, gives birth to you, lives and dies by your each faltering step, fed you until you could feed yourself, helped you learn to walk. My little boy, how can I let this happen to you? I will not, I cannot, Jesus, you must not. God, please. You can imagine Mary saying at this point. Hannah, I mean, if you look at the other mothers in the Bible that, that, that maybe Mary had enough education or enough um, connection to the biblical stories to, to see some role models of. Hannah didn't have to face this exactly. She prayed for a son, and she says, well, God, you know, if you give me a son, I will offer him completely up to your service. And I'm sure there were moments in Samuel's life where Hannah's like, oh man, this isn't good. 
So maybe that was helpful to Mary. Even Sarah, right? Sarah is like almost the opposite of Mary. Mary doesn't believe that she can have a child because she's so young and that she is virginal and, and all of that. She's a little girl. And Sarah was up in her age and she had thought that she was past the point of being to have a child. Um, and she does both miracles. When Abraham takes Isaac away to go up the Mount Mora. But in that case, Sarah, who we talked about in Sunday school, she's not necessarily in that story, but she's in that story. Her shadow is there on that story very much. And the key to that story is though, though Abraham and Isaac go up, they come back down, both of them together. You can see Mary praying to God, God, can't you do that same thing for me? Jesus prays in the garden of Gethsemane, may this cup pass. You can imagine Mary with a parallel prayer. May my son not have to go through this. And if so, if he does, can you walk him back down the mountain to me when it's all over? On the, um, I, I originally had written the service for a Good Friday date, and, and we adopted it to Monday, Thursday, adapted it to Monday, Thursday. But in this line that, that Corley reads, that Mary at the cross, that is, Woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother. Um, that line from the cross is, I, I paralleled with this, and I would carry the big manger that you all have and put it there so that we could remember that the manger is very much present there at Easter, kind of like Sarah is not in the story, but yet is in the story, that manger being there. I would say, could you imagine watching your child go through with it? The trial, the beatings, the cross, because you know you feel every lash, you feel the pain, you cry each tear, even the words would hurt, the jeers, the accusations, that's my son. I remember holding him, him lying there in the manger, and there was a moment when he was just mine, mother and son, before the shepherds came. I, 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 I wrote that line, before the shepherds came, because there was this great song that the, the organist at Gordonsville Church's daughter is a professional songwriter, her and her husband travel around, and they had performed this song at church called Before the Shepherds Came, and it was this beautiful chorus about, I will rock my baby before the shepherds come. Right there, and it was that sense of trying to create that moment where Jesus is just Mary's son. Um, <clears throat> so I put that line in there for that reason. Only to this it has rent my heart in two. Behold, he says, if only for one more time, one more second, one more day, I could just hold him rather than behold him. Right, and that was my favorite line. I give them credit for the before the shepherds came, but I'm going to hold that one. That if I could hold him and not behold him, that that moment where you just want your child and not the glory and not all the grace, not all the, the, the grandeur, could I just hold him rather than behold him? My son would truly, my soul would truly magnify the Lord if he would just look again on his lowly servant and show me one more time the strength of his arm and give me one more moment, and then I would truly call myself blessed. I put in the, in the bulletin one of the great songs from Garth Brooks that was after a long, his long time off from performing and recording, um, he wrote this song called Send Him On Down the Road, and you can see the lyrics there in the bulletin. You, you, you can't cry for them, live or die for them. You can help them find their wings, but you can't fly for them. Because if they're not free to fall, 
<coughs> then they're not free at all. And, and though you just can't bear the thought of letting go, you pick them off, dust, pick, pick them up, dust them off, and send them on down the road. And that's the great challenge of being a parent. And it was very much so for Mary, and we see that. She is the great shadowed figure throughout all of Jesus' life. And each of us as parents will have that in some way, shape, or form where we have to experience the trust and faith of letting our children go out into the world and be what God has called them to be. And that's not always the most safest thing ever. I used to um, hate the 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 um, the code of conduct at Blue Ridge that it had. The first one was like, "Be your brother's keeper." It's that keeper that I don't like because that means a lot of times keep them safe, keep them in a cage, keep them locked up, keep them safe at any cost. Not allow them, not love them. Love your neighbor. I thought was so much more important. Because love includes experiencing those things that will teach great lessons, even if they're difficult. And for Mary, love included the cross and seeing her son walk up that hill, only to burst forth from the tomb on Easter Sunday. God does just like with Abraham and Isaac, they do walk down that hill together. But it's kind of a different story for Mary, isn't it? But one whose pain is equaled and doubled and infinitely multiplied by what Easter means. And so I cannot imagine being Mary. But I thank God that we are given a chance to be parents, to be loving, to be understanding, and to have parents that will teach us that ourselves. And may Mary be that blessing. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, on this amazing Mother's Day morning, may we thank you for all of the miracles of the moms that we have. The life that they give us, the care and the love that they show us. The fact that it becomes not about them, but about your will and your truth and their children moving forward, reaching towards potential that is not safe, but good, dangerous, but for good. May we all have the ability to let go of the shape and the form, but to let go and to believe that just the same way that God is working in our lives, that he may be working in the lives of our children, in the lives of other children around the world. We thank you for mothers who have to know that truth beyond all else. We want to pray on this day for those that are hurting, those that are um, facing more medical procedures, those that are recovering from them. Um, may that recovery be strong and may those procedures that are upcoming be successful. May your hand be in all that is as we know it will be. Your will is always in it. May we take this moment of silence to include the names of those that we would like to pray for this morning.
My God, hear our prayer. We know that you do. We know that you work. You know us so well, forming our inmost parts, that you know us before our prayers can even 